Welcome, everyone. Uh, I think that we're ready to start our afternoon panel. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to be talking about the spread of misinformation and collective action, and we have three great speakers uh, here today. Uh, we have Sandy Pentland, David Rand, and Manal Ravel, um, some of whom I are my co-authors, so this is great. So I can, I can say, uh, I think that they're not presenting co-authored work, so it will be of good quality, so uh, it's great. Uh, but I think with this, I'll just turn this over to Sandy for the first presentation. Uh, afterwards, we'll have time for questions. There's microphones there, so when the time comes, just please line up for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sandy. Great. Okay, let's see. So I should hit uh, show on this, is that the idea? I think. There we are. So um, this panel's about misinformation, but the truth is I'm not so concerned about misinformation. I'm concerned about collective action. How does that misinformation turn into collective action or lack of collective action? And um, a perfectly good example, or perhaps a primary example of that is democracy. Democracy is something where people have to come together and vote, and it's the social structure. And how does misinformation fit into that? Um, and what we see, of course, out in the world, but this is just clear from history, is, is that often the sort of uh, problems here come from mutual suspicion. Those guys are doing this. Those guys are doing They don't want this, right? That sort of thing. And, and it's in the interest of politicians to fan that sort of stuff uh, because it gets them reelected and gives them more power. And it's in the interest of our today's media because it sells more copies, more clicks. Uh, it's a problem. Um, but there are solutions that have been developed. For instance, uh, the, perhaps the best known is in um, nuclear conflict between Russia and the uh, US during the Cold War where nobody would share information, but they agreed to share a little bit of information that was about strategic intent. You know, where are they massing things? Are they you know, doing this? Things that would indicate what their plans were. And those they agreed to have inspections about and to share data and allow sort of over flights and photography. And so what with my co-authors we did is we asked, can we do this more generally? Um, and so, we did a, a, a thing where we asked, uh, used prolific to ask 5,000 uh, demographically and politically balanced people about their intentions. Do they want to you know, replace or close down voting booths in the other guy's territory? Do they want elect politicians that will you know, subvert uh, the law and so forth? And uh, what we found was interesting. So the left believes that the right is all for cheating. That's what that graph says, right? So fair on one side, cheating. The left, which is like mostly the people in this room, think that those guys are like the bad guys, okay? But if you ask those guys, and you know, this isn't a, a place where they can give an honest, secret response, they have no such bias. Well, that's interesting, okay? This is the part that's really interesting. If you ask the right about the left's bias, uh, intentions, they think that the left is out to subvert democracy for sure, despite all the, and all, in fact, that all the noise about protecting democracy is actually a cover for subverting democracy. But of course, if you talk to the left, you see that they have no such intention at all. And so uh, this is about intention, and um, what we thought was, well, gee, you know, uh, just like in the START treaty and things like that, maybe we can do something about that. So we designed a very short intervention, it's like five minutes of question and answering of this sort of data. You know, are they going to do this? Or do they want to do that? And then we gave them the right answers. Um, and being a university, maybe we were a little bit plausible. Uh, but what was surprising is we got pretty dramatic changes, not only in people's beliefs about the other sides, but a couple of weeks later, their voting behavior. So they voted for people, they would not vote for people who were more extreme because of this little intervention. And this was replicated at Stanford in what they call the mega study. David was part of this. 32,000 people, they surveyed 140 interventions to strengthen democracy, took 25 of them, and tested them out on these 32,000 people. And this intervention 
uh, was the strongest across a variety of, of categories. There's some other interventions that are similar to this that you know, did a little bit better here or a little bit better there. But there's something here. It's not just what we did, it's what these other people, the Stanford folks, sort of replicated. And I think this is really something that we ought to think about. My interpretation of this is that intentions are hard to perceive. There's no, I can't read your mind, right? I can see some of the actions you do, but only at some, and some of those could be fake. And so I care more about making sure that there's a clearinghouse of things that are indicative of intentions than I do about misinformation per se. So I'll just start there, and uh, I'm sure David will come up and say things that are complimentary at, uh, at best, okay? All right. Well, I'd like to begin by complimenting Sandy. <laughs> uh, Complimentary at best. All right. Um, so I'm Dave Rand. I'm a faculty at Sloan in Brain and Cognitive Sciences. I'm very happy to be part of IDSS and uh, to talk today about um, work that my group has been doing on misinformation. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I feel like social media has been the major focus of when people talk about circulation of misinformation and fake news and stuff like that. I mean, like, oh, there's no gatekeepers. Any people can post anything they want, and it goes viral. And we do study social media, but I think it's really important when we talk about uh, misinformation to remember that, mis that social media is not the only place or necessarily even the biggest place where misinformation and like false claims are getting circulated. The mainstream media plays a, like, uh, a major role in this also, and political elites themselves are either directly producing lots of false claims or amplifying false claims. And so all of these things interact, interact um, and there's this feedback between, you know, when a crazy, when a person, some random person posts some crazy thing on social media, it in general doesn't go viral in some bottom up way. The way it gets big reach is when an elite retweets it and then the media writes about it uh, and so on. So, um, you know, it's important to keep this in mind as the backdrop when talking about misinformation. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, we have some like overall uh, like learnings from um, lots of different studies around what are the factors that make people more likely to believe information or misinformation. Um, and so uh, this is from a review paper that we did that synthesized a whole bunch of work from the last four or five years. And uh, there are like a few factors that make people more likely to believe claims regardless of whether they're true or not. So it can be used to make people believe false claims but is just sort of generally sort of uh, belief inducing. So one thing is repetition. When you hear the same claim again and again, uh, you're more likely to believe it, even if it's something you don't want to believe, even if it's a claim that goes against your politics, even if you're a smart, cognitively sophisticated person, there are these low level effect, like cognitive effects that are very hard uh, to get around. And that's why you'll hear politicians repeating false claims again and again and again, and it just starts to ring true eventually. Um, people are also more likely to believe claims that uh, align with their pre-existing beliefs. Um, and sometimes this is some kind of motivated process like confirmation bias where you're biased to believe things that you like, but also this can be totally rational um, and like a, a rational Bayesian that's doing their best to have an accurate understanding of the world. When you get a new piece of information, you're trying to decide how accurate is this. Uh, you're sort of jointly updating your belief about the world and about the reliability of the person that's giving you that information. And so it can be totally rational to say, it's more likely that this person is wrong than that everything else that I know is wrong. Um, and that leads to the other th uh, thing that makes people generally more likely to believe things is if it comes from sources that are trustworthy. Um, because again, you know, part of it could be motivated, but part of it also makes perfect sense from a rational perspective. Uh, you know, if it's a reliable source, then you're more likely to believe that information, particularly if that information contradicts what you otherwise believe, then it's important that it comes from a choice, uh, source that you think is credible. Um, then there also are factors that make people specifically likely uh, or specifically susceptible to believing false claims. 
Um, and something that we've done a lot of work on is the role of reasoning in critical thinking. There's this uh, general sense uh, out there that we're in this post-truth world where nobody cares about accuracy anymore and everybody's reasoning powers are hijacked by partisanship and stuff like that. And I just don't think that's true. It's what I thought was true before we started running a lot experiments and we just have a ton of experiments that are not consistent with that. Like in general, when you get people to engage in more reasoning, they're less likely to believe false claims regardless of whether those claims align with their politics or not. So I think uh, a, a really important factor here is people just not thinking carefully, either because they just don't care that much about the issues that they're thinking about, or I think one thing about the social media context that does make it a challenging place for misinformation is people are scrolling quickly and not really paying close attention, so they're less likely to think critically, more likely to believe what they come across. And similarly, there's a bunch of studies showing that uh, lack of digital literacy or media literacy, which is kind of a squishy concept, but um, you know, there are different ways of operationalizing it, and more or less, however you slice it, people that are uh, less digital or media literate are more likely to believe false claims. So, uh, you know, this, it's, it's well and good to understand the psychology of misinformation, but uh, what I'm really interested in is the practical questions of what can be done to combat misinformation, and in particular, I focus on what social media platforms can do to combat misinformation, because I think unlike with political elites and tr uh, traditional media organizations, with social media, there's the people that are producing the content are not the same ones that are distributing it. So the distributor, like the platform, could intervene. There's like there's room for intervention if they were willing to do it. And so, you know, uh, what tech companies mostly do at this point is they use machine learning and artificial intelligence to try and, you know, build you know misinformation classifiers, uh, which is great, but it's not. Uh, so it turns out to be a very hard problem because it's hard to come up with good training sets because true and false is not actually a clean binary, but things exist along this continuum, and you know it's it's hard to really precisely say where content is there, and so it's hard to train models, and so there's also a lot of partnering with professional fact checkers where you know trained professionals do detailed research, classify things as true or false or misleading, um, and that helps inform the algorithms. But then also once the platform has decided that something is misleading information, either based on the classifiers or the fact checkers, they can either demote it, which is push it down in the news feed so people are just likely to, less likely to see it, or they can put warning labels on it that say that it's probably not true. And both of these things are very effective. Um, there's a lot of research in particular that shows that warning labels make people less likely to believe and less likely to share content. Even people that don't trust fact checkers uh, respond to the fact checker labels. Um, but the, the big question is, how do you do this at scale? There's like you know, a handful of professional fact checkers even in the US. There's no professional fact checkers essentially in most, uh, in many parts of the world that don't have histories of, of uh, you know, free press and things like that. And so the, just the question is like, how can you do things at scale? And so a lot of work that we've been doing suggests that the wisdom of crowds can actually be harnessed to help identify uh, inaccurate content at scale. Uh, it's not it's not at all intuitive to think, oh, you should ask random people on the internet what they think is true and average those responses out and it's going to work. But there's you know more than a hundred years of evidence showing when you aggregate lay people, uh, judgments, you can get things that, that turn out quite well. So we did this project where we got from Facebook a set of URLs that they needed fact checks on. We hired three professional fact checkers to read the articles and do detailed research on them. We also recruited 1,100 Americans for like 15 cents a minute from Amazon Mechanical Turk to just read the headline and lead and rate how accurate they thought it was. And we randomized whether we told them the source or not. And then we asked how well the results of the fact checker research line up with the um, results of the crowd, just reading the headlines. So I'm going to show you on the um, on oh, whatever on the um, the y-axis is the correlation between the layperson ratings and the fact checker ratings, and on the x-axis is the size of the crowd, so like how many people's uh, judgments we're aggregating, and. Uh, as, a, as a sort of baseline, we look at the correlation amongst the three fact checkers themselves, because they were far from unanimous. Um, and what we find is source info helps a little bit, but the critical part is with 15 or 20 lay people per article, you get as much agreement between the lay people and the fact checkers as you get amongst the fact checkers themselves. Uh, which suggests, and it works just as well for political as non-political headlines in this data set, uh, and it suggests that the crowd wisdom can actually be helpful for identifying problematic content. We also have a paper um, that Adam was a co-author on where we did this in 16, using COVID misinformation in 16 countries, and we find 
uh, everywhere, basically, you get a good pr crowd performance, and almost everywhere, you get really good crowd performance. Um, and this is something that Facebook is now doing and that Twitter has been doing. Um, and so I think this is really promising. Crowds are scalable, they're fast, it doesn't centralize truth in any one person's hands. Um, but it creates a public goods problem or a collective action problem of how do you get people to be willing to spend their time rating things, and also uh, how do you avoid the tyranny of the majority where um, you know, majority groups uh, can sort of certify falsehoods about minority groups. So I think that uh, this is really powerful, uh, but another uh, nice thing about the wisdom of crowds is that um, when people are online, they're distracted, they're not thinking about accuracy a lot of the time, um, and so they may wind up sharing things they didn't mean to just because they didn't think about what they were doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, through this framework, if you get people to consider accuracy, for example, by asking them to rate the content of headlines or of news posts, it will make, it'll increase the quality of their own sharing. And as some evidence of this, we did a field experiment on Twitter where we created a bunch of uh, bot accounts. We followed uh, 136,000 people that had shared links to Breitbart or Infowars. 11,000 of them followed us, us out, followed us back. We screened out about 6,000 of those people for looking like bots themselves or have not been sharing anything recently. And then we sent them a message where we basically are like, here's a random non-political headline. How accurate do you think it is? Um, and we did a stepped wedge randomized rollout, so we do real causal inference on the causal effect of receiving this message. Um, and nobody responds, but that's fine. We don't need them to respond. We just sending the message is enough to sort of prime the concept of accuracy in their mind. And then what we find, or the question is when they close out <clears throat> and they go back to their feed, are they more likely to share higher quality information or less likely to share misinformation because the concept of accuracy has been primed? And that's what we find. <clears throat> this is one way of visualizing it. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to show you one uh, dot per news outlet. The size of the new last outlet is proportional to pre-treatment sharing, so these people were mostly sharing Breitbart and Fox News at baseline. This is the quality of the news outlet as rated by fact checkers, and this is the causal effect of the treatment of like, getting that message on the fraction of their tweets linking to those outlets. And basically you see this strong correlation where uh, priming people to think about accuracy is decreasing their sharing of low quality outlets and increasing their sharing of quality outlets. And so, you know, platforms can do things where like while you're scrolling you know, as a pop-up or in feed or whatever, things like this to try to prompt people to think about accuracy, to create an a, a information environment where people, or an intention environment, where people are less attending to the social stuff and more attending uh, to accuracy. And this is something we've been uh, talking to lots of different te tech companies about and working with tech companies on. It's also something that uh, you can do yourself using videos. Um, we worked with some NGO to put together this uh, ad based on our research that they ran during the 2020 election. Got a lot of uh, engagement, um, and we've done some field experiments on Twitter using Twitter ads to deliver these uh, kind of accuracy nudges to people and found significant decreases in their probability of sharing links to low-quality news sites. So just to summarize, uh, you know, rep repetition, consistency with prior beliefs and trusted sources make people more likely to be believe claims regardless of whether they're true or not. A lack of reasoning and literacy selectively increase belief in false claims. Um, AI and professional fact checkers are great for identifying misinformation, but it's not enough. They can't keep up. Uh, and we find that lay people are surprisingly good at and invested in information quality if they're actually paying attention. So crowdsourcing can be a powerful tool for identifying low, low quality sources and articles, and also shifting attention to accuracy increases the quality of the news that people decide to share. And these both offer, um, oops, what happened? I went the wrong way. Ah, sorry. And these both offer scalable approaches uh, to reducing the spread of misinformation that don't rely on centralized authorities deciding what to censor. So, thanks. <laughs>
um, and a community from which I greatly benefited during my PhD. I'm also really uh, honored and I have to say intimidated to be coming after these amazing speakers and I'll do my best to follow up with, um, on, on, to follow up on these presentations. So like uh, Sandy, I've been really interested in the collection uh, action part of this prompt, where the collective is a nation and the action is making decision. It's, it's the old fashioned decision making, decision making problem of you have a group of people, you want to try to make democracy uh, that, that, that works. And so my work has been really focusing on this question of how do we do democratic governance uh, in a way that is that is functioning. I grew up with this idea that democracies, liberal democracies, were kind of an end to history. That was the you know famous Fukuyama's idea that liberal democracies would bring a stable point to uh, collective organization and that that would be the end. Now, it's no surprise that democracies have been threatened and uh, have not been at their best in the past years. You know, we can talk about the failure of the different democratization waves around the world uh, about the indexes about democracies that are declining, 17th years of democratic decline according to the Freedom House. We can also talk about particular events. It's hard not to think about failures of democracy without talking about the storming of the Capitol on January 6, 2020. And so it seems that there is something that is not quite uh, the end of the history. And, the, and if we actually step further back thinking about uh, how institutions work, there is this idea that we find around the world of social cycles. This is something you find in Ibn Khaldun that studied the Arab world in the 14th century, in Sima Qian, who studied the uh, early Han dynasty, Chinese dynasty, and Plato and Polybius, who studied the democratic institutions. It's this idea that institutions go through cycles and they fall and rise. And the common patterns of the fact, or why there is a fall at the end of some cycles, is that some of the institutions get hacked. Hacked is the word of Ruschnayer. The idea is that the institutions get taken advantage of and that they are not performing what they are supposed to be performing. And so the, the question I want to ask you is, is, do we think that there is something so special about our time in history that we are not subjected to these different cycles? And that do we have a, a reason to believe that we are in this stable state that we should not worry about? Because as, for instance, Gary Kaspers have, uh, have thought, these uh, democracies is self-generating. I don't exactly know the answer to this question, but I want to err on the side of caution and think that maybe there is something institutionally that we can think about in terms of the collective action. And I took the, prop, the, the prompt of ICS very seriously, the idea of trying to bridge the, the technical side and the domain knowledge uh, side together. And I spent a lot of my time in recent years talking with people in political philosophy and practitioners that do democracy. And some of the things I feel I, I learned is that um, misinformation definitely is part of a problem. And what I want to talk to you about now is a complementary part of the problem that I think of as the uh, institutional design problem. Let's step back a little bit. What is the point of democracy? Why is democratic governance so hard? Well, because we are trying when we do democracy to accommodate the plurality of opinion. We have to make decisions and we have to be coerced by decisions we might very well disagree with. And this is kind of crazy, the idea that there is ever a stable point in me accepting to be forced to do something or to be subjected to a policy I profoundly disagree with. There is something crazy with the idea that this even holds. How does it hold? In modern democracies, we have these three ingredients the minimal viable set of common principles. In the US, this Bill of Rights, the idea that you have a common understanding of what are the principles that you will stand for and that you want everyone, regardless of your you know, social status, wealth status, to be protected. Then you have an institutional design, which is the rules by which democracy governance is made. This is the rest of the Constitution. It's oftentimes in the US, but in most countries, prescribed by the Constitution. And then you have something I think of as a belief which is the belief that the democratic process matters more than my opinion. And this is where almost it's, you know, almost miraculous that it works. And this belief is really the glue of the, the legitimacy of democratic governance. And this glue has two legs. One that is intrinsic, it's the idea that the process is fair and will deliver good outcomes. Um, sorry, the intrinsic is the idea that the process is fair and so that I'm treated fairly as anyone else. And the other leg is instrumental. It's the idea that the process will bring about good outcomes, either because it's a stable process that's going to protect my eco economic and social st uh, situation, or because in the most optimistic way, we can think that democracy is actually the one that delivers the best substantive outcomes in people's life. This belief is, is threatened, and this poses a problem on how we can actually do democratic governance. There are so many figures about why you know, this belief is threatened. Just one out of the many, this poll from 2022 Gallup found that 
Um, 7% of the American believe that, uh, have a great deal to quite a lot of confidence in the US Congress. There is something profound about the fact that we don't trust the processes that are, uh, that are happening. Why is that? Uh, it's a very hard question. There are so many different aspects. As I said, one, I think, uh, profoundly relates to issues related to the social fabric and misinformation that both Sandy and Dave talk about. And um, that we can't, what, so the, the, some of the things that it creates is this idea of effective polariz polarization. If, like this poll, you believe that the other side is close-minded, dishonest, uh, immoral, and intelligent, and lazy, why would you want to accept the outcome of a process that is decided by the other side? Now, the point I wanted to make is that there are other problems that may be causing this lack of trust in the process. And it's the problem of the institution, the institution that might not be delivering what we expected to deliver. And again, there are so many people having different hypotheses on what these problems are. I just want to name a few. One is Larry Lessig's idea that there is a problem with campaign financing, that campaign financing acts as a filter on who we can vote on uh, at the time of the elections. Another idea is gerrymandering, the fact that you can look in the color of the district prior election so that it actually influences the outcome in such a way that the um, that the, the, the winner uh, is pre-selected by the design of the election. Another uh, aspect is the lack of responsiveness of the institution. This is a very interesting study uh, from 2015 by Gillens and Page that find that the predictive probability of adoption of a policy is basically completely unresponsive to the proportion of people that uh, do uh, favor this policy change. And so in a sense, all of these hypotheses are examples of institutions being quote unquote hacked or used in a way that is not how they were intended to be used. And it's no surprise that around the world there is a lot of people talking about the need to change the political system. In the US, 85% of uh, the people surveyed in uh, 2021 by the Pew Research Center found that the political system needed reform. And there are so many ideas out there about how to do this. Should we change the primary system to an open primary system? Um, changing the voting method to ranked choice voting or approval voting? Changing, reforming the electoral college? Or changing the size of, of the house? And this is where I'm going to get a little bit blue sky uh, in terms of other ideas. Uh, and I think I want to, to try to prompt you on thinking that there are also other reforms that fall outside of the scope of electoral democracy. Because we have associated the idea of a democratic process with election. This is kind of how to wire in how we've been thinking about democracies in the past 250 years. But I want to try to prompt uh, you with is the idea that Democratic process is not equal to election. In fact, elections don't even imply democratic process. There is this idea we talk more and more about electoral autocracies. Um, and not to say that election is not a way to do a democratic process, but just that these are two different uh, concepts and that election is one mode of uh, doing democracy and one mode of representation that has really good uh, guarantees with it. But I, I just want to broaden the idea that maybe there are other ways of doing democracies. So elections is the one we know. We have candidates and we need to choose amongst these candidates. We can vary how we have to choose, how many people can run, all of these things. But the core idea of, of the elections on the positive side is this Schumpeterian idea that elections come with a competitive struggle for people's seat and that you can trust the people to differentiate and to find the people that are intrinsically self-motivated and that align with their preferences. But as we've seen, elections have failure mode and you have other ways of doing uh, representation and democracy and collective action. One is this idea of lotocracy that is similar to the process that uh, David Rain was talking about, which is the idea of just taking people at random and let them decide. I don't know what you think of this type of ideas. It's, it's really popular um, in, in, in certain um, part of the uh, academic world in particular for the idea that lotocracy will protect diversity. For decisions where you want to have people that have a diverse perspective and that don't have blind spots, you want a group that has a variety of, of experiences, lotocracy is the one that will protect your selection process from uh, hacking that will impact the diversity of your, of your process. Now, lotocracy, in turn, if you think of it as the term, as at the scale of a nation, won't allow everyone to participate in their lifetime in the process and won't have this connection that we have with election through voting. And this is just the idea that these different modes of representation have, again, just pros and cons. Another one I want to mention is uh, this idea of liquid democracy. As much as elections are really popular, lotocracy have been tried around the world and around history. Liquid democracy is a much more recent uh, concept. And it's the idea that you can delegate your vote transitively to people and it's a per issue vote. So let's say we have to design a bill on um, the action that IDSS could take to uh, cut carbon emissions of the community. Maybe we want to elect a group of people that can work on this, but um, 
I know very little about climate change and I might trust someone that a peer of mine, a fellow student who I know work on climate change and this person might know something about someone else who knows about climate change. And the idea is not to use the first order knowledge that we have about issues, it's to use the second order knowledge, which is the information that people have about this information. And so the idea of the liquid democracy is that you completely cut the entrance barrier. You don't have a filtering process. Anyone can just decide to self, uh, self to, to opt in in the, in the system. And then you, re you leverage these trees, these delegation trees, to identify the people that we think might, um, might be the local experts. And so one of the premise of liquid democracy was to be able to identify the experts. Now it's really hard to do A-B testing with countries and to ask a country to just change the governance system to try and, and see what's, what's working and what's not working. And this is where uh, a math field social choice theory has been trying to model these different systems to try for us to understand the directions in which they, they might go. I don't know what you think about modeling democracy and such you know, large, complex problems uh, with, with mathematics. The, um, this field actually started in 1785. Uh, and you know, it's, I've never found whether a good historical account on whether there is any correlation between the finding and the birth of democracy is just an interesting just a position of idea that the theorem at the basis of collective intelligence that's also on which the, the work on Galton and others had been kind of um, followed up on this idea that a majority, so the, the collective intelligence theorem is this idea by Condorcet of 1785 that the probability that the majority is correct is going to converge to one as long as the average probability of the individual is above a half and that you have enough people. And it's just interesting that this way of modeling democracy is just happened at a time where democracies were being born. And this is a framework that we've been using uh, with my advisor, Ali Babai and our co-authors at Harvard uh, and uh, MIT, Elhanan Mosel, um, Daniel Halpern, Ariel Prokacha, and Joe Halpern, to basically model liquid democracy and to try to understand whether it is true to think that in certain circumstances, liquid democracy can identify the experts. And basically, you can pose this as a math problem, where you have a network, and you have people that have certain probability of being correct, and you can just look at the different delegation processes that induces a distribution over all of the possible graphs. And the, the each graph uh, maps onto a, um, a voting um, outcome that you can then study mathematically. And, um, I won't bother you too much with here the details, but the idea that we can model these systems, try to understand how people delegate, and try to understand whether the delegation indeed helps finding people that have more information than, uh, than the crowd. And we do find that we have a substantial improvement. I just want to let you with this idea is that there is something pretty interesting happening these days, that this, this core belief at the, really at the glue of the legitimacy process, that the democratic process matters more than winning or my opinion, is not guaranteed to to keep holding and that as much as I want to think that you know this is a stable system that brings about some type of, of, of stability, um, we don't know whether we are just at, in, in one cycle that might just brings about something else and it might be worth thinking about different ways of distributing failure modes to strengthen democracy. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, those were fantastic presentations. Um, so we'll take some questions and maybe if people have questions, come to the microphones. And as we do, I just wanna say a, sort of a couple things that bring together the, the themes of this panel. Um, you know, I think what, what's really great about all this work is I think it exemplifies a lot of what's going on at IDSS in terms of trying to bring you know, systematic theorizing in an empirical way to understand critical social problems. Uh, so I think, you know, Sandy's uh, work, I, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at the Strengthening Democracy Challenge, uh, this meta paper. I was on the advisory board for this, and right, there were several hundred different interventions proposed. And what's really nice about this is that they were, they were tested face-to-face. -face. You know, sort of a lot of how scientific work goes is sort of like a back and forth. You know, a lab has a result. Another lab tries to replicate us in a slightly different way, slightly different conditions. They say, well, that's not quite right. What's really nice is this was an umbrella test head to head of all these interventions. Uh, so they ranged from, you know, Sandy talked about kind of uh, learning about the other side. Uh, there's a eight minute guided meditation uh, where you can sort of have mindfulness. Um, that didn't work quite as well, but I, I showed it to my undergrads in my class a few weeks ago, they really liked that. Um, but the idea here is to, that we can systematically test this, right? And we can do it under conditions 
that we can get real knowledge. You know, same thing that the stuff that Dave talked about, uh, talking about the crowdsourcing, uh, the, the work that he did um, was in conjunction with Facebook. Uh, at that time, I was working for Facebook as sort of internally, and I think what's really nice there is kind of seeing this back and forth between the academic work and the internal work, and I was sort of bridging the gap there, trying to translate for each other, but that really could have implementable solutions. Uh, same thing with Menon, her, her work, so uh, she kind of rushed through the experiment, so um, appreciate that, but I encourage you to take a look at it, They're really interesting, right? So we'll take a situation where we have questions where we know the correct answer, right? And then there we can have a real measure of performance, and we can see how does liquid democracy do against direct democracy? And so I think here is really this accumulation of knowledge in a scientific way, in a way that's very credible that we can bring, uh, bring knowledge to the world. And so I think that this has really been a, a really nice discussion around the issues of polarization, uh, a democratic process, misinformation that really shows uh, the best of what IDSS can do at the intersection of data, systems, and society. So uh, with that, um, I would like to turn to the audience and see if folks have questions that they would like to ask of the panelists. Great, please. I'll take a stab. In terms of identifying misinformation that you talked about, what, what about when it becomes very real time, you know, with chat GPT type things where you're having a conversation with a million people at once through Reddit or whatever, you know, um, doesn't seem like, you know, these methods are all based on some time lag, right? And reposting of one content as opposed to just continually generating real time misinformation. Yeah, I mean, the, the time lag is a major challenge for platform attempts to combat misinformation. And honestly, I think that's one of the biggest limitations of the professional fact checker thing, is professional fact checkers do detailed research and it takes time. And there was some estimate that, uh, this was a few years old at this point, so I don't know to what extent it sped up, but like it was, you know, median time was two to three days for professional fact check which like when the content gets most of its engagement in the first, yeah, I don't know, 12 hours or day or whatever, two days, it's like that ship has sailed. Um, and so I think one of the things that is nice about the wisdom of crowds approach is it's potentially much faster. Um, because like, so also, you know, there's a huge amount of content that's posted every day, but you don't need everything fact checked. You just need the stuff that a lot of people are seeing evaluated. And so you could essentially, essentially have some system where when the platform sees a, a post or you know some kind of statement starting to get traction, they immediately get 20 or 30 people to rate it and just get essentially a gut check of like, is this crazy or not? And then you put the brakes on if things that seem, that basically that the crowd gives a low rating to and then you know it's not perfect, but it, it, it helps suppress things and it can be done more or less in real time. That's sort of the power of the crowd. Like you cannot ask, or at least the stuff that we're doing, to ask them to do detailed research, but just do like, does this seem plausible or not? And so also it's not identifying truth. Like it's a different thing from what the fact checkers are doing. They're not doing research and saying like, is this true or not? But just like, does this seem reasonable? And you can certainly come up with lots of false claims that the crowd would totally believe, but those would in general be boring claims that nobody would care about. And so I think part of what makes it work in the social media context is that the stuff that does what, like what makes things do well online is a certain bit of sensationalism and over the topness that then the crowd uh, can pick up on. So uh, another thing to remember is uh, misinformation doesn't just pop up randomly. It tends to come from specific sources and spread in specific ways. And they're very, very patterned. Um, so that suggests for us as a reputation mechanism. You could use ch fact checkers or whatever, but the uh, judgment is an average judgment of veracity appended to the person posting the information. So be careful, this guy's wrong 20% of the time or something like that. So that's one way to go about it. Um, the scary thing that, that I'm beginning to think about and other people are thinking about is uh, with things like the large language models, it's possible to customize a stream of messages just for you and what you do, right, and how you respond. 
And so you can imagine something where 95% of everything you see is somebody trying to persuade you. And we know that this works bloody well, okay? Um, I, people are very persuadable in those sorts of situations. Um, and what are you gonna do there? And uh, the only sort of thing that I can see is you have to have, uh, like we do with money, you have to know who it is, there has to be a digital identity. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, revealed, but it has to be something that's certified as a physical identity, how the message was produced, and uh, what the chain of that was, so that you can apply filters and say, I only want these sorts of sources, I want to make sure it didn't go through uh, a tumbler or something that is uh, questionable, uh, and uh, can sort of know the, have a, a diagnosis of what it is that you're getting. It's not a complete cure, but if you think about the really nightmare things, you have these entities that are producing questionable content, they're producing inhuman amounts of content, and we ought to be able to do at least a uh, short-term uh, firewall for that. The longer-term thing, of course, is to be able to prevent uh, the ability of machines to be able to target you repeatedly in a way that's not visible that it's a machine. Uh, the best thing that I've seen out there as a sort of stopgap, actually, is in the EU, uh, they're asking for political advertising that the platforms do know your customer and that they be liable for that. And the platforms are saying, there's no way we can really be liable for that. We just won't have political advertising on these highly interactive platforms, which solves the problem in the short term, but not in the long term. Stuff to think about. Great. Uh, I have another question here. I wondered if Sandy could comment a little more on the uh, data he gave about intentions and trying to understand people's intentions. How can that be signaled both on a kind of a bigger scale and maybe even on smaller, you, you referenced like Cold War intentions, it's kind of smaller level negotiations so that it's still credible and doesn't seem like somebody's man manipulating you by giving you that intent data and actually using it in a meaningful way to improve outcomes? Well, so the, uh, you know, the Cold War was an example of something like that where um, at one level, what was set up were international institutions that were there many eyes on it that were vouching for the credibility of the data. You can't do a perfect job, not in the sort of sense of a, a, a proof checker or something like that, I don't think. But you can have uh, things that, that vouch for the chain of measurement to delivery of whatever the data is. And I can imagine things where uh, you had to have, uh, for each uh, political group, you had to have a more or less real-time reading by them of what they were intending to do and that they would be held to that when they, if they were elected. So, for instance, in uh, Brazil, and uh, there are certain parts of Brazil where when you run for election, you have to say what it is you'll do, and if you're elected, they set up an independent commission, a sampling commission, to evaluate you. And if you don't what, do what you said you'd do, you do, you're out, right? <laughs> so, so and, and there are a number of other things, like Mark, Marshall Van Alstyne across the river here has uh, a mechanism whereby you ask people to post a bond, essentially, uh, for things that, are deem, that they deem to be credible. And if something doesn't have a bond attached to it, don't believe it. If it does have a bond, well, then they have some skin in the game, too. I don't know that there's a perfect solution. Those are just the ones that are sort of being discussed. Yes, another question. Hi, I'm Sally Haslinger, and is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. So um, uh, thanks, and I'm in, in philosophy at MIT, and I have a question from Anon. I really liked your paper a lot, your presentation a lot. Um, I think that you focused on three things that were the sources of distrust in democracy. It was campaign financing, um, gerrymandering, and lack of responsiveness. Um, and it, it seems like, yes, the models that you suggested might be 
helpful in responding to those. But I think a, a large part of the mistrust in democracy comes from white conservatives, white Christian conservatives who think they're being outnumbered in their, and their culture is gonna be destroyed because the majority rules and they're not gonna be in the majority. And these options don't seem to address that at all. Um, and then what happens is that they try to take over um, in various ways and then the left gets upset because they think that we ought to have a different kind of country than that. And so I'm wondering if you have any suggestions of how to really deal with the, the culture wars in the background, which seem to me a really important part of the mistrust, mistrust in democracy. Thank you very much for your question. So, um, so I think the short answer is, uh, is no, I don't have an answer. Um, and, uh, and so the, um, as I was trying to, I think, get at, I, the problem is really complex and I, I spent my PhD thinking about this and the more it went, the more I found that it was even more complex than I understood. And, um, and so it's why I tried to broke this. Uh, initially, I wanted to show you a picture of a car stuck in the mud, uh, thinking that there were, there were different aspects to our, uh, our current situation, this idea that we are either stuck in the mud or just sliding down some type of a, of a, of a slide, and that there are different components. Uh, one is the social fabric, which I think the one is, is the one you're getting at. It's, it's the terrain on which we're writing. That's, that's a problem, and I think it, it touches upon a lot of the work on misinformation and effective polarization that we also know um, is being reinforced by the, uh, these un, uh, the civic technologies, I would say. Um, and the part I wanted to talk was, was really the car itself, so the institution. Not to say that the social fabric is not a core problem as well, it's just it's not the one I particularly uh, focused on. And, and I think the other piece I want to add to this is that the, um, I've been working at the Ash Center this year and uh, I worked a lot with electoral reform officials that are actually doing democracy. And I realized that you know, in a way it's, it's great to think blue sky and I think it's really helped to try to just frame from a philosophical perspective what we could achieve. But there is also a really s strong fence of the political reality and that thinking about all of these ideas also need a theory of change and that the theory of change can't happen without the context, without the, the, so, the social fabric, which is I think some of the pieces where I'm getting at lately, but it's why at the moment, I uh, completely agree that it's a core problem, I just don't have the answer. Can, I think that's super interesting and it touches on something that I was thinking about during your excellent talk, um, which is that the like liquid democracy, it seems like in terms of changing the way governments make choices, that's gonna be very hard because as you're saying, there's all this institutional baggage and history and whatever. But uh, in terms of the way other institutions like social media platforms work, there's much more flexibility. Essentially, you need Zuckerberg to decide something happens and then it happens, um, which whatever, that's its own challenge, but whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but what I'm thinking about here is like the, the question of um, the, the like crowd-based identification of misinformation or just crowd-based mechanisms in general, like usually the way it works, as you said, is essentially you just survey some people and average them, so it's like the lottoocracy. But I wonder if there's some way that like liquid, the liquid democracy kind of ideas could operate in that space. Like David Carger at CSAIL has been working on a platform where like you say how much you trust different people and you can only you can say I only want to see information from people that I trust or that's ag aggregating trust scores across different people and stuff like that which feels like sort of in that direction but then in, to your question about culture war stuff when I was thinking about the liquid democracy in that section where essentially you can cede your vote to the people that you think are experts like that works well well my, my intuition having not thought about it so I'm curious what you think is that like uh, if there's some kind of general consensus around expertise, then you are gonna wind up selecting people that have more expertise by asking people who do you think have expertise. But when things are super polarized, then selecting the experts is actually gonna wind up picking the ideologues and it's gonna push things in a more extreme direction. Um, and so I'm, that, that's sort of what, what I was thinking while, while you were talking. So, two things. Um, Short one is, uh, I'm always suspicious of statements like you made. So in the, the data that we collected, we found that both liberals and conservatives assigned intent to the other side uh, in equally inaccurate amounts. And this has a lot to do with the fact that the press, the conversation is something that we call nut picking, which is you find this 
crazy person, and you, uh, they're genuinely crazy, right? But what you do is you paint this whole group with that crazy person, and in fact, there may be a very large number of people that have a different view. That's just one comment, to, to be cautious. Can I quickly respond? But, but respond? no, wait, let me finish, right? I was just saying, you said that one comment, I was gonna respond to that one before you went to the other one. Okay, okay, please. Uh, so, so, but the other one that's really interesting to me is that uh, we have a habit of the last 70 years or so of always going to national things and not allowing regional or local variation. And it may be that uh, allowing communities to decide their own rules as long as it's visible uh, to others and sits within guidelines that preserve human rights and so forth uh, is a way to do things. And uh, I grew up in the uh, Black Panthers era and the number one uh, demand of the Black Panthers was freedom for their community to rule itself. And I think that that might do a lot for this uh, uh, problems that we have today. Uh, Sally, did you wanna? Yeah, I mean, if you wanna, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, actually, so I'm gonna take uh, moderator's prerogative and ask a question. Uh, I think very interesting, so the, the back and forth that Dave and Manon just had about sort of thinking about the conditions under which liquid democracy might work. So the kinds of experiments that you've done, Manon, are thinking about factual questions, and Dave raised the, the question of, well, you know, what about if these are more sort of, I want to say, not, not factual, but more opinion, more kind of value-based decisions. And I think kind of what, what's interesting about that discussion that I hadn't thought about before is thinking about kind of the hierarchy of expertise when we're talking about dealing with decision-making, not just around misinformation, but around, uh, around democratic decisions as well. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if you had some thoughts, either Dave or Manal, about the idea of, you know, how could we bring some sort of expertise to crowdsourcing and the insights in the work that you've done individually? So I know you're know, something more like a Wikipedia model, or you know, Dave and I were uh, talking with Twitter about this product, Birdwatch, that became Community Notes, but the idea of how you can have a constrained crowdsourcing. So maybe, uh, you know, if you had any thoughts about, about that, um, either of you. I'm going to be thinking out loud. Um, the first thing I think I want to react on is, um, I think you're completely right that this, it's not just about these different modes of representation that have different points of failure and can be hacked in different ways. It's also that they apply to different contexts differently. And, uh, and the space of problems we're having at, at the level of a country, which is the one I was focusing on, uh, I'm thinking more and more about this, the specific of social media governance. And, and what I found really interesting is your, in your work is thinking about the process through which we make decisions, not thinking at the outcome level, what's true and what's wrong, because you know, starting there is, is going to get us into fights. So the fact that these systems are also good for different things, that the lotocracy aspect is really good if you, want, if you have something that's more moral-based. Um, in terms of building legitimacy and that the liquid democracy might be better for a very specific issue on which there is expertise. I, I took carbon as a, you know, not mm -hmm. innocent example of something for which I know I don't have expertise and I'd rather have someone decide on my behalf. So I guess how I link this with the crowdsourcing question is that it depends what you're cr crowdsourcing on and it depends what is the outcome you're trying to achieve and what is the context there. Um, the experiments we did uh, together and with Ellie as well showed that for these very specific contexts that are not polarized, by the way, all of the experiments we did uh, were in, in companies and, and universities, classes, uh, research conferences are places where the questions were not being polarized and the groups knew themselves pretty well and, and were not being polarized. We did find that these, th there was attraction to bring about this expertise, that using this second order knowledge and this network effect and this interpersonal knowledge did increase the crowdsourcing uh, effort but again, this was really dependent on the context. And our theory is also very context dependent. It's for pe you know, crowds that connect, that know each other well. And um, so I, I guess in short, mm -hmm. I'm convinced that these approaches can bring better uh, outcome to crowdsourcing, but it really depends on the context of the group you're, ha you're dealing with and the question you're trying to, be, uh, you're trying to answer. May I add a comment? Uh, yes, here, yes, please. Oh, I am Laura Gerret from Italy, and while I was uh, listening to your uh, uh, talk, uh, and you were talking about this um, 
different kind, the lotocracy and so on. And when you were saying about uh, the third one, so the one we were discussing, I was thinking of uh, something, I don't know if you have compared this to what happened in the past, because if you think about democracy last, uh, last two centuries ago or last century, essentially men, white men, were the only one that were voting, rich white men. So in a sense, they were thinking that they had the knowledge and other people, like the women in the family, thought, oh, they have more, more knowledge, so I trust them, and they were an, an oligarchy that were ruling the, the world. So I was, think, I was th thinking if you have compared this uh, method you were uh, showing with what happened uh, in the past, just comment. So liquid democracy is the third one has been has been used anecdotically really at this point. So it's it's hard to have a country level comparison of how it could uh, impact the these type of questions. The and I think it goes to the question of this this history of elections and the fact that election is one way to do democracy that again, you know, has a lot of a lot of thought went into this and some of it was not just uh, to, to gain control. There was actual philosophical perspective for why elections could work. But this is, I think, a question, the question you're asking is the question of implementation and, and how the implementation can just be, again, I'm using this, this term by Birchneyer. He's a cryptographer, so I guess it's, but it, these, these things can be hacked and cannot serve the purpose that they are trying to, to serve. Um, maybe one thing, I don't know if it's the, the type of things you were thinking about, but I would add a, a, about liquid democracy is that one might be worried, one might be worried that by using these endogenous processes, you might also reproduce some types of uh, social things that we take for granted, such as uh, would it be the, the case that people that come from certain group would be more likely to delegate and then more likely to self-select not to be part of the, of the assembly? And for me, this is, these are really important questions. And again, you need to think about the context where you're trying to achieve. Is it at the country level? Is it about crowdsourcing? Is it uh, at the level of the social media companies? Um, but in many circumstances, we, we should be worried that we would have self selected patterns that are hurting the, the process of democracy. An interesting little thing I discovered recently that is that at the founding of this country, there were states in which women and blacks could vote, but only land owning women and land owning men. And that somehow there was a political process that disenfranchised them everywhere within the first, say, 30 years or something like that. Uh, which leads you to ask, well, so was this capture by the wealthy? That, uh, you know, <laughs> what was going on <laughs> that they actually uh, franchised women landowners and, and black landowners in various states? That really surprised me uh, and, and points out the sort of dynamics of the situation and what was maybe really going on. Intent is hard to know, right? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about the, the liquid democracy. Yes, I think it's th th this question of, of basically bias, uh, building in bias because of people, uh, like differential willingness to delegate makes total sense and seems like a problem. And, and also I feel like part of what I was getting from your question is, uh, so different groups may be more or less likely to delegate to others and that is not gonna be random, but like, you know, there's like a social construction and all that, um, which is, is a really good point. Um, and this doesn't really address that, but I feel like it maybe helps address the uh, polarization part, although maybe not, I'm just thinking on the fly here. But I feel like if you say, you have to delegate someone that you actually know, like, because I feel like if you asked a lot of people, okay, you have this vote, now who do you want it to go to? Say, oh, I'll give it to Joe Rogan. Or you know whatever I'll give it to like the, the people that are because like the, the, the people like get information from that seems like not great to me, uh, but it could be if you say amongst the people that you personally know like who do you think is like most knowledgeable about this or something it might work out better. Although the, the, the counter to that is at least in the context of politics, there's a ton of work showing that people that are more politically knowledgeable are also more polarized <clears throat> and sort of more extreme because. Pull, like knowledge comes with engagement usually. Um, so, yeah. One thing about the, the experiments you do, which I'm 
going to read a lot more about because that was only mildly familiar. You mentioned that they probably knew each other pretty well. So this is, again, sort of one of the things that fascinates me about the founding of this country is that you know, these are very small communities, maybe a thousand people. People literally knew each other. And what that meant was is that there were reputation mechanisms at play. So if I was uh, elected as a representative and I did something that hurt you, uh, you might be the school teacher for my kids. I was going to pay for that, right? And so, so there was this sort of uh, uh, trade between people because it's not just this issue that is being decided. They're not independent. You're not anonymous. It's all coupled. And everybody has, uh, ideally, everybody has some um, skin in the game and some vulnerability. And that might be something that allows you to expand it is these sorts of uh, richer reputation mechanisms that tie uh, your interest on one thing to your interest on other things. Yeah, and I just say on the reputation front, that's, I think reputations are super powerful and it's something that I did a lot of work on in the context of cooperation. But the thing that I think is sort of tricky about reputations in this context is basically reputation, like a good reputation system like works to stabilize a social norm. And that, like, if there's some words that's determined this is the appropriate behavior, then a reputation system is used to enforce that behavior. But the problem is what the norms are differ across groups. And so in the same way that in a group that is oriented in a certain direction, the reputation system can push people to be honest and co cooperative and whatever, also in groups that are have coordinated on different norms, it's going to push it in the other direction. And particularly in the misinformation type context, when you have groups that have agreed that, uh, you know, there's a deep state and like the you, you can't trust the man essentially, uh, then the bad reputation can be a badge of honor. <clears throat> there's a certain sense in which you know if if your community that you've chosen to be part of believes something crazy. Go for it. <laughs> You'll pay, right? Well, except that they. But, but you have to limit their ability to interact with other people. Right? Exactly. There have to be these very strong guardrails, uh, uh, because you know one of the things that because I tend to study individuals and small groups more than larger things. One of the things that's very striking is that people are able to learn over time. Uh, if it hurts, they generally stop. Not maybe as soon as they should, but uh, having that sort of feedback of stupid things cause you to hurt is probably important in the long run. Right, but again, what they're learning to, to do depends on what they're getting hurt for. Yeah. So I think we have time for one or two more questions. Does anyone else from the audience? Great. Great. Hello, Natalie Lorenz Anderson, the class of 84, EECS. Um, so happy that you're here. This topic is uh, super important to many of us in the room, and, I, and I'm one of those. Uh, working with League of Women Voters, for example, uh, or working in past elections with MITRE's squint effort, where it was kind of a crowdsourcing, you know, look for misinformation, send it in, and then fact checkers who were trained to do it right would provide the feedback and then get that information back out to next door or other media, right? So where I'm hoping we'll learn more is that both David and Sandy in particular mentioned things that you've done or learned that could easily be shared. Well, I don't know how about easy. Should be shared broadly in our communities, speaking of working locally, right? So we have groups of people in our communities that are talking about setting up forums to have civil discourse, conversations, teach each other, right? So how do we take what you've learned and done and, and bring that into our communities quickly. You know, we don't have time to wait years to get this, get this done. So I'm curious what you think about that. Well, one of the things, uh, just a, a practical thing, one of the things that I see is that there is a lot of uh, data that I think people would admit is absolutely unbiased, like for instance, uh, averaged IRS data, averaged by census blocks. If you had that, and uh, Raj Chetty up the street started looking at that, turns out there's some very simple things that predict whether 
uh, kids will grow up successful or not. I mean, that data has been in the hands of the government. It doesn't threaten individual privacy, but communities, researchers generally, don't know about it. If you could make maps and have discussion groups around data like that, it would be pretty interesting. Similarly, there are very strong uh, correlations and arguments for causality uh, that communities that are cut off from the rest of the city by poor public transportation, by other sorts of things, uh, fare much worse than ones that are richly connected. These are maps. These are not like very controversial. You can stand out there and count the buses, right? It's not very controversial, but, but it's pointing at knowledge about how communities work and the affordances that they have is not widely disseminated. I mean, we have maps of the geography, but we don't have maps of the, the human landscape. And having that sort of thing, I think, is, uh, is critical. So we're building these sort of human landscape things. You can look at inequality.media.mit.edu, uh, or you could look at um, uh, opportunity.mit.edu, although that's a little cruftier, uh, uh, just to sort of see what large-scale data from these sorts of sources can tell you about your community, right? And, and I think in terms of the question of how do you get constructive conversations, um, I mean, one first thing is like, do people want to have con constructive conversations or not? And so getting people that select into saying, I want to have a conversation about it, already should make things somewhat more promising. But I think that coming out of a lot of the depolarization work, uh, stuff like what Sandy was talking about, is saying that a lot of what drives uh, dislike and in sort of endorsement of like in incivility essentially is the assumption that the people on the other side are extreme and they're going to be uncivil uncivil incivil whatever uh, and uh, the and and sort of correcting those incorrect perceptions about what other people's perceptions can go a long way and so I think that there are these kind of more concrete advice of like before you all sit down to have a conversation uh, you know, basically understand where the other people are coming from. There are also these discussion techniques of like when you have a disagreement, like you have to start by like trying to state the other person's position back to them and have them agree that like, are you actually ap accurately represent, like do you understand what it is they actually think or what they actually want? And then when you sort of work that out, you realize, oh, a lot of the time there's actually like more overlap than you might think. and. One place that I've seen this work is in the context of adversarial collaborations and science, um, which is a place where there are very bitter fights uh, and highly polarized groups around scientific topics. Um, and it's interesting that when you have people have, uh, you get two sides of, of a debate to be like, oh, here, we're gonna do a project together, we're gonna try and figure out a set of experiments or studies or whatever that is gonna like, settle our differences, the first thing you have to do is define what is actually our difference. And I've done this a couple of times now, and it's turned out that the difference is actually way smaller than people thought it was until they sat down and tried to actually hash out what do we really disagree on. Okay, well, thank you. And uh, please join me in thanking our panelists.